Hi there. My name is Aaron Landerman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech. In the previous lecture of guitar amplification and effects, we performed a small signal analysis on a differential amplifier structure called the long-tailed pair. In this lecture, we're going to look at a self-bias scheme for such a structure. The long-tailed pair has two inputs. VI1 here typically comes from the last preamplifier stage, and VI2, if you have it at all, usually provides negative feedback from the transformer that helps linearize the response of the amplifier, and we'll look at that in a future lecture. We're going to have a pretty high bias voltage at the grids, so we need some explicit AC coupling capacitors. As far as V1 goes, an inverted version shows up at output 1, and a non-inverted version shows up at output 2. And similarly, as far as VI2 goes, an inverted version shows up at VO2, and a non-inverted version shows up at VO1. Recall that the grid leak resistors here are typically the same and much, much bigger than RK prime and RT here. So their main purpose is to take the voltage here at the bottom of RK prime and teleport it to the grid for the bias scheme. And because RG is so big compared to these other resistances here, they didn't really play a role in our small signal analysis. And as far as exploring the bias goes, remember we open up the capacitors and we're assuming that no current is flowing through the grids. So essentially the voltage here shows up here. Now, there are many instances of long-tailed pair where the load resistors are the same, but there are many examples where they are different. And so this caused us a lot of pain in the last lecture. It will lead me to make some potential approximations in this lecture. For convenience, I'm going to define an RK that's the sum of these series resistances. So after looking at the Fender Princeton and the Dumbelator in some previous lectures, I thought it would be good to get back to the Mesa Boogie Dual Rectifier. Everything to the right of this line here, all of this stuff is the main power amplifier stage. And wow, look, it has four tubes. One, two, three, four. This can really melt your face off. Anyway, the output tubes here go to a transformer, and then the transformer sends the signal out the speakers. And we'll look at all of this kind of stuff in a future lecture. I will mention here that the transformer here, this output transformer, is a big source of weight in your tube amp and cost that's not present in transistor amps. The long-tailed pair is all of this stuff over here, although it's a little hard to see because like it's drawn in a lot of actual tube schematics, it's flipped sideways from the way I've generally been drawing it. So let's take this bit of the long-tailed pair and flip it 90 degrees. Now that's still a bit tricky to read. Like the load resistances here, this 82K and this 90K, they're sideways. We'll probably want to mess with this a little bit more as far as redrawing it to get a feel for what's going on. All right, so if I take a look at this, remember we're thinking about the biasing. So we open up all of the capacitors. This one's open, this one's open, they're all opened up. So we don't really need to worry about what's happening with the feedback loop here. That's a small signal thing. This one's open too. We'll come back to this question about what this presence knob does in a future lecture. That's a small signal thing. All right, so as far as the resistors we need to worry about go, here's RL1, that's 82K. Here's RL2, that's 90K. This 470 ohm resistor is our RK prime. Our grid leak resistors are one mega ohm. And this 10K in series with this 4.7K, that's our RT. So let's redraw this a little bit. So basically I took the schematic, I loaded it into an image editor software, and I just kind of rotated things around a bit and resorted them to make it look closer to what I drew before. Looking at the power supply schematics, I found that VPP was 422 volts. And we can simplify the tail resistance down here and write that as 14.7K. I've mentioned in a previous lecture that 
if you see a K in the middle of a number like this, that K is basically taking the place of the decimal point. And this helps you deal with the situations where you have a fragile decimal point here that might get lost in some kind of photocopying process because you don't want this dot here to disappear and have somebody think it might be a 147K resistor. So it is a little tricky dealing with these two resistances, and the way that I tend to deal with it is to not deal with it at all. And basically, when it comes to the biasing, just use the average of the resistor values, and then I use the actual different resistor values when computing the small signal gains and the output impedances, because that's easy to do. Now, I do want to justify that a little bit. So the general trend here, regardless of what you're doing with your load resistances, is to basically take the circuit and split it into two halves, where what I've done here is I've taken this 470 ohm resistor and replaced it with two, let's see, I guess that would be 940 ohm resistors in parallel, and take this 14.7K resistor and replace this with two Let's see, I guess that would be 29.4 resistors in parallel. And we can imagine connecting these two here. But the reason I didn't draw this connection is because what we're going to do is we're actually going to analyze these separately. Now, if you really, really, really wanted to get perfectly accurate bias points, I think you would probably have to shove this into something like SPICE. I don't know of any way to handle this in anything like a convenient fashion directly without using computer aid, without making some approximations. To justify my approach of just generally using the average of these load resistances, what I'm going to do is I'm going to analyze each of these halves separately and show that you get pretty similar results. Now, you can't really analyze these separately unless these load resistances are the same because there will be some interaction here. This isn't completely balanced, but we have to approximate somewhere, so we'll start there. Okay, so now we can find bias points just the way we did for the cathodyne and the self-biased cathode follower. All we really need to do that's different is take our original RK prime and RT and multiply those values by two. So as usual, let me start by assuming that all of the voltage is dropping across the tube and none of it is dropping across the resistors, so that corresponds to the zero current case. And to get another point, I can assume that none of the voltage drops across the tube and all of the voltage is dropping across the resistors. So this 2 times 15.17, that's 2 times this 470 ohm plus this 14.7K. So dropping 422 volts over a total of around 112 kilo ohms gives me a current of 3.75 milliamps. So these are the two points that I can draw on the graph for the 12AX7 output characteristics yielding this particular load line. So now we need to draw a grid line. So I need to pick some grid to cathode voltages to plug into this expression where the denominator is twice RK prime. So I'm going to try minus 2 volts. The minus and the minus 2 volts cancels with this minus, and that will give me 2.1 milliamps. I'm also going to try minus 1.5 volts, which gives me 1.6 milliamps. So this gives me a couple of points I can draw on my graph. So for the minus 1.5 grid to cathode voltage line, I'll have that 1.6 milliamps. And for the minus 2 volt line, I'll have 2.1 milliamps. Now I can draw a line connecting these and then take a look at where that intersection lies, giving me a quiescent current of 1.65. And I can sort of read it to this level because these grid spacings are all 0.05 milliamps. How significant that is? Well, who knows? Remember, we're doing a bunch of approximating. And then the quiescent plate to cathode voltage is 235 volts. Now, this was for this load resistance of 82 kilo ohms. Let's try the same sort of thing for the other half with this 90K. 
again, this is all an approximation because I'm assuming that these two sides aren't really interacting, which they won't because it is unbalanced, but, you know, it's rock and roll. Anyway, if we do the whole thing again, but we were to, say, use this 90K instead, I wind up with a point on the vertical axis of 3.5 milliamps. So the load line is not quite as steep as what we had before, but it's pretty close. Now the interesting thing about the grid line I'm about to draw is it basically intersects this minus 1.5 volt grid to cathode line. And I know that because I already did this analysis. So what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna try minus one and minus two and minus 1.5 and see where that all falls. So I already computed the currents we need to get a grid line associated with 2 volts and 1.5 volts. The only thing I need now is to also do a line for 1 volt. And really, I guess technically I should have said minus 2 and minus 1.5 and minus 1, but those minuses, of course, cancel with this minus here. Anyway, if I were to take a look at this point and this point and draw a line between them, I wind up with a grid line that looks something like this. And notice that it does cross this minus 1.5 grid to cathode voltage. And if I looked at where it intersects, that's pretty much what we computed. So that's kind of going backwards a little bit. Now, the fact that this lined up so nicely on this line we drew is because we're operating up here where these various grid to cathode lines are fairly evenly spaced. If we were operating down here, trying to connect the dots like this would probably give me something more of a curve, which is why when you're drawing one of these grid lines, you really need to pick adjacent grid to cathode lines. So it's a little redundant to say that the quiescent current that we find from this intersection is 1.6 milliamps. And if we look at the plate to cathode voltage, that gives us a quiescent voltage of 225 volts. Now, if I compare these results with what I got for the 82K leg, well, they're basically the same. So I have 1.6 versus 1.65 milliamps and 225 volts versus 235 volts. And so if you were to use some sort of average between these, like a, like say 86K to begin with, you would wind up with something in between these values. And the main point of all of this is to get this quiescent current so we can look up what the dynamic plate resistance is. And that's not going to change a whole lot between here and here. For the sake of argument, let's say we picked a quiescent current of 1.6 milliamps. To absolutely no one's surprise, we would get a mu of 100 ohms. And here, let's see, we get a plate resistance of 56K. Now, if I were to look at, say, what it is at 1.65, which is somewhere in here, well, you'd probably read off the same RP at that point. So it's not that big of a deal. Anyway, let's take these values and plug them into the monstrous formulas that we computed in the last lecture. Remember that this formula for the output voltage on the left side includes this RIK2, and that's the impedance looking up into the cathode of the tube on the right-hand side. And here, that's going to be the load resistance on the right plus the plate resistance on the right, which we'll just pick to be that 56K. And if we compute what that is, that gives us 1.4 something kilo ohm. Now the signal coming from our preamp is VI1, and here I'm not worrying about the feedback path, so let's ignore this VI2 term. And plugging in all of the numbers, we wind up with this horrendous expression, which I computed for you and found minus 30.2 something times VI1. Notice that there is a minus sign here, so this is the inverting output with respect to this input on the left. All right, so what about the output on the right? If I compute all of the various quantities I need for that, the main difference is that I now have 82K instead of 90K here. Again, I'm going to assume that the RPs are the same.
And logging through the expression here is a little bit more complicated because remember now the preamp signal is coming into VI1 and we're ignoring the feedback path, which is VI2. So this factor here is now in play. And if I plug in all of the numbers, I wind up with something like 30.288. And notice that's pretty close to what we computed in the last slide, except it now has a plus sign instead of a minus sign. And that's happening here because Randall Smith, the designer, chose to make these load resistances be different to compensate for the effect of this term. If he had used the same values for the load resistors, you would see more of a difference in the absolute values here. That said, there are plenty of examples of amps that use the same value for both load resistors. So there is an imbalance in the long-tailed pair and they just don't worry about it. So what about the output impedances? So the impedance for the left output using the formulas we derived in the previous lecture turns out to be something like 57.2 kilo ohms. And the impedance of the right output turns to be something like 60.29 kilo ohms. And if I compare the outputs, the output resistances are close, but they're not the same. And that's not surprising because remember those load resistances are different. But on the other hand, if I look at the absolute value of the gains, these are pretty close together, precisely because Randall Smith used different load resistors.